everyone, and welcome to the ADA Compliance on Construction Projects webinar. My name is Lisa Washington, and I work in ODOT's Office of Outreach in the Division of Opportunity, Diversity, and Inclusion. We thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule this afternoon to join us for this session. As we get started, please take a moment to locate the questions box in the GoToWebinar panel on the side. During our presentation, if you have any questions, please uh, put them in the questions box. We plan to answer our questions and answers at the end of the complete session, but there may be some questions that we will address um, after uh, different presentations. With that, we also have some handouts. Uh, you will see those noted. You can download those handouts. You will also receive a copy of the handouts and a copy of this recording um, in an email, which will probably come to you tomorrow. So with that, let's get started on today's presentation. Let's go. And again, we welcome you to the Americans with Disability Act, commonly known as ADA, Compliance on Construction Projects. Our agenda today, I will talk just briefly about ODOT and also the ODI, Opportunity, Diversity and Inclusion Division. My name is Lisa Washington and I am the Northwest Regional Outreach Manager for ODOT. We will have a presentation on ADA transition plans that will be presented by Sarah Wade. She's the ADA 504 program manager for ODOT. Christina Scales, who is the ADA 504 and Title uh, VI specialist for ODOT. She will also be on our uh, session. Sarah will present the presentation and Christina will be available for any questions. Next, we'll hear about ADA transition plans utilized. We have Shane Coleman, who's the Executive Director of Lyman Allen County Regional Planning Commission, and Cody Doyle, the Associate Planner for Lima Allen County Regional Planning Commission. Our next session will be ADA construction. Scott Mullins, District Construction Engineer with ODOT District 1, and Cody Lape, our GEMS Database Administrator out of ODOT District 1 will present that session. Then we will go to our questions and answers. About ODOT. ODOT's mission sorry, is to provide easy movement of people and goods from place to place. To do that, we will, we take care of what we have, we make our system work better, we improve safety and enhance capacity. And you see a lot of that being done by a lot of the work and construction that's going on out on the highway. We are more than 3 billion per year enterprise and we invest the bulk of our resources in system preservation through maintenance, construction and snow and ice operations. The session today is actually being um, presented by uh, the Division of Opportunity, Diversity and Inclusion. Within the division, our deputy director is Lauren Purdy. We have three offices that are um, in our ODI division. Our first office is the Office of Business and Economic Opportunity. Deborah Green is the administrator. That office handles our DBE and SBE certification, the DBE reporting, DBE and edge goal setting, DBE supportive services program, and on the job training program. Our office of contractor compliance, and I'm sorry, that's civil rights uh, compliance. Katie LaPlace is the administrator. That office oversees our prevailing wage, Certified Payroll, Commercially Useful Function, or CUF as it's commonly known, monitoring the Americans with Disability Act, ADA Section 504 and Title VI. 
the Office of Outreach with Deborah Green as the acting administrator. This is the office that I'm part of. Our office provides a statewide, regional, and district outreach to DBE, SBE, MBE, and EDGE firms. Also resources and referrals for those companies. Uh, we assist the firms in doing business with ODOT. We also partner and work with the business community, um, also our own internal resources within ODOT. We provide sessions and workshops as we are doing today, uh, our DBE and small business webinars, events, uh, matchmaker events, various events of that uh, nature. We also have a focus, we're working on workforce diversity and inclusion. So not so much as trying to get a workforce, um, the HR section, but really looking at um, a diverse workforce, particularly out on our highway projects. Our Office of Outreach Contacts. Uh, down at the bottom on the left side where you see my name, you'll notice that I will be the acting Southwest Regional Outreach Manager in ODOT Districts 7, 8, and 9 starting on Monday. Many of you know Jalita Stoltz, who is the current Southwest Regional Outreach Manager, and Jalita will be taking on a new role within ODOT um, starting Monday. She will be our uh, DBE uh, manager. So uh, congratulations to Jalita. But in the meantime, um, I will be covering the Northwest region, um, which is shown in the blue, the dark blue region uh, in the Southwest. We have Lynn Stevens, uh, who is the other outreach manager. She covers the central region for ODOT. She's also covering the Northeast region. Um, we hope to have that position filled very shortly. So currently, um, Lynn is covering kind of the Northeast section of the state. Um, so again, most of you do know us. If you have any questions or any uh, comments or follow up, please contact myself or Lynn, and again, you will have a copy of this presentation um, sent to you, or you can download it today. So with that, we want to get started with our sessions. I am going to introduce to you Sarah Wade, and also I will introduce Christina Scales. And bear with me, I'm sharing my screen with Sarah. Okay. Forgive me also, um, normally we've used GoToWebinar before our office, ODI, has purchased this software. So this is actually the first time that we're running um, a webinar, we go to webinar. Usually Victoria Bill is behind the scenes there. So just kind of bear with us today. <laughs> a short intro for Sarah and Christina. Sarah Wade works at ODOT Central Office as the ADA 504 Program Manager, where she is responsible for managing the ADA-related assets in the right-of-way, the ADA components of all of ODOT's facilities, including rest areas, as well as reasonable accommodation requests for employees and applicants. Sarah has worked for ODOT for 15 years and has 22 years of state service. Christina Scales, Works as ODOT Central works at ODOT Central Office, and more recently transitioned into her role as the Accountability Contractor and Title VI Coordinator. Prior to that, she still worked with the Title VI program, but also split her time to assist in the ADA program, where Christina completed 
accommodation requests, facilitated trainings, and contributed to the right-of-way work, collecting data and information for ODOT's transition plan. She earned her Bachelor of Arts in Communication from Bowling Green State University, and she has been with ODOT for four years. So Sarah, take it away. Thank you, Lisa. <laughs> Um, and yes, just uh, because I wanted to make sure that um, there was enough time for the real meat of the information that you all are here to here to get uh, to receive today. Um, uh, I'm just going to go through briefly um, the background information and then we're going to try to quickly get it over to um, uh, the, the our folks from um, Lima Allen County Regional Planning Commission, and then our District 1 experts um, to go over uh, the rest of the information. So, let's see here, there we go. All right. So, um, good afternoon. Um, I did include the um, uh, some some legal framework, the references, and that sort of thing in the presentation today um, for you to take back um, should you need uh, those. Uh, items for uh, reference, but we're, we're not going to spend time going over them. Um, basically, uh, the gist of it is these are the requirements um, and uh, where the, the framework um, has come from. And I am going to go ahead and turn my camera off so that there's not a lag in the presentation. All right. So um, again, uh, Section 504 of the uh, Rehab Act of 1973 and the Americans with Disabilities Act of 1990, um, along with Section, uh, uh, the ADA, along with Section 504, um, explains uh, why th these requirements are here and how we have to comply with them. And so um, none of these uh, laws or regulations are new. Um, the newest one was the Americans with Disabilities Act, which was signed in 1990. Um, however, the main requirements of the ADA were supposed to have been, and I say supposed to have, um, for obvious reasons, but were supposed to have been completed um, no later than 1995. So in theory, um, you know, everything that was deficient, uh, years ago should all be perfect <laughs> or should have all been perfect uh, no later than 1995. Um, however, um, that is not a reality anywhere. Um, there is still uh, quite a bit of work to be done. And so that's, that's in essence uh, why we're here. Um, the primary purpose of transportation related ADA programs in state and local governments is to ensure that pedestrians with disabilities have the opportunity to use the transportation system in an accessible and safe manner. So FHWA, which is uh, the Federal Highway Administration, they have a regulatory responsibility under Title II of the ADA um, to ensure that any recipient, any entity that they uh, pass federal funding or federal aid to, so any state or local entity um, that receives any sort of financial uh, support um, that have under their jurisdiction any roadways or pedestrian facilities, it's your responsibility to make sure that you do not discriminate on the basis of disability in any program, activity, service, or benefit that you provide to the general public. In essence, it's to ensure that people with disabilities have equitable opportunities to use the public rights of way system. So the laws and regulations require accessible planning, design, and construction in order to integrate uh, those things into, uh, into the assets. So an example of the assets that ODOT is responsible for, um, which will apply to some entities, and some of you obviously won't have some of these uh, assets, but any of your physical facilities must be accessible. Uh, any uh, accessible transfer, any transportation services also must be accessible, uh, including bus stops. Um, assets in the public rights of way also must be accessible. For example, rest areas, pedestrian overpasses, underpasses, and sidewalks, pedestrian ramps, pedestrian signal heads, and push buttons, uh, parking, which also includes 
parking meters, uh, crosswalks, and refuge islands. So since this covers such a vast um, area, this means that planning organizations, consultants, contractors, uh, construction companies, state DOTs, local governments all play a part in making sure that those assets are accessible. There are some high priority items um, in the rights of way. Definitely curb ramps are always a high priority item, a uh, hot button topic, um, always, uh, always something that <laughs> takes up uh, a lot of our time in uh, planning, construction, design, all of those areas. Um, another area is pedestrian signal heads, um, which goes along with crosswalks and also public parking, uh, including the access into the buildings are another high priority item. These are also areas um, where we as a state DOT receive the highest number of complaints are related to these four areas. Um, and we have heard from some of our local partners that that is the same for them as well. Particularly, particularly public parking in, uh, in municipalities um, always seems to draw uh, some issues. Um, so the curb ramp requirements are also not new. Uh, these requirements have been around for quite a long time. Um, but the gist of it is that when streets and roads are newly built or altered, they must have ramps wherever there are curbs or other barriers to entry from a pedestrian walkway. Um, also, when new sidewalks or walkways are built or altered, they must contain curb ramps or sloped areas where they intersect with streets and roads. So you have to be able to um, give a pedestrian a safe path out of traffic. Um, when we resurfacing a street or sidewalk, uh, that's considered an alteration. Um, however, filling potholes alone will not trigger the alterations requirement. Um, if anybody needs more specific information on that, Federal Highway put out a uh, graphic that kind of explains that. Um, you can reach out to me and I'd be happy to send that. Um, let's see, so um, one suggestion is to um, integrate your curb ramps um, into curb ramp correction into a curb ramp policy at your local entity. Um, so the curb ramp uh, policy should also reflect a priority to walkways serving government buildings and facilities, bus stops and other transportation services, places of public accommodation, uh, business districts, um, followed uh, lastly by walkways serving strictly residential areas. Um, it's also typically very appropriate for a city government to establish an ongoing procedure for installing curb ramps upon request in both residential and non-residential areas um, frequented by individuals with disabilities. Um, if any of the entities participating today have ever received a complaint from a citizen um, surrounding a curb ramp, uh, I think they would uh, let you know for sure that if you ignore those requests um, or don't properly address those kind of requests, um, that typically then can uh, bring some additional um, scrutiny and issues your way. So it's always best to give those uh, requests uh, a high priority rating in your in your system. Um, so this is just a quick graphic. Uh, Cody Lape uh, from District 1 is going to go in from our District 1. We'll go into a little bit more um, about our assets, but um, to kind of tie in how this, uh, the ADA work, uh, how that ties in with uh, the contractors and the consultants that are on uh, the webinar today is that there are lots of opportunities um, for improvement in these areas. Um, I don't believe that ODOT's information is any different than um, any other uh, local municipality. Um, we all have lots of assets um, and we have lots of assets that have issues with them um, for various reasons. So currently ODOT owns and maintains approximately 5,000 curb ramps 
um, 1,500 push button structures and 1,600 push buttons, along with 3,500 different spans of sidewalk statewide. Um, local municipalities typically have a much higher number than ODOT does because our jurisdiction is strictly um, outside of incorporated areas. So all of the high pedestrian trafficked uh, um, areas within a municipality are going to belong to those local municipalities. So um, all of our assets have a high number of deficiencies for, like I said, for various reasons. Um, and that is typically the same for the local governments as well. So there's lots of opportunities for um, contractors and consultants to make sure that they understand the scope of the work and the, uh, the specifications of the work so that when they are um, given an opportunity to work on some of these projects, they understand um, all of the uh, little small details that are required to uh, make sure the specifications are met the first time. So I just wanna go over a few common questions that I typically do receive um, when I am asked to do any sort of uh, training, uh, these are, I think, are my five most commonly received questions. Um, do all projects, even those that are 100% locally funded, have to include ADA 504 compliance upgrades? And that answer is simply yes. Um, number two, if a roadway resurfacing alteration project does not span the full width of the road, do I have to put in curb ramps? Um, that answer is a little more complicated and it depends um, on whether the resurfacing work affects the pedestrian crosswalk. If it does, then curb ramps must be provided at both ends of the crosswalk. Uh, you can't send someone out into traffic and not give them a reprieve and a way out of it. Uh, other than road resurfacing, are there other requirements that trigger the obligation to provide curb ramps? And that is yes, at newly constructed altered roads or sidewalks in order to eliminate barriers between the two as a means of providing program accessibility and as a reasonable modification under Title II or a reasonable accommodation. So um, those are uh, the th three most common. And then um, this is another couple of questions that do come up quite a bit. Um, particularly for local municipalities, do public utility companies working in the rights of way have a responsibility to adhere with the ADA? And that answer is yes. In your local government, uh, your local municipality, you are granting permission to that public utility company to work in your rights of way. Um, so you absolutely can require the utility company to comply with ADA requirements. For example, if you have an existing curb ramp that is non-compliant, uh, let's say the scope is or the slope is uh, is a uh, six percent instead of the uh, uh, maximum of two percent. If they have to remove that curb ramp to run their gas line underneath, for example, they cannot put a curb ramp back in with a six percent slope because that's what it was before. They have to do the best they can to meet those requirements. Um, to get it down to the 2%. Um, and then the last uh, common question is, are truncated domes detectable warning devices required at alleys that meet sidewalks and pedestrian paths? Um, the answer to this one is maybe. Uh, curb cuts, curb ramps are required at alleys. However, the truncated domes or detectable warnings are only required when the alley in question is known to have significant vehicular traffic. Some say a good indicator is that the alley actually has signage or a name, um, but alleys that are obviously not used by vehicles uh, often do not meet the truncated dome requirement. And those are the five most common questions that I do receive um, from local governments and municipalities. So um, as I stated, uh, I was keeping um, my part of the presentation uh, very short. Um, we will be taking questions at the end, like Lisa uh, said. Um, and uh, 
I have included, I think, two or three slides with links to um, the different uh, references that I typically point people to for all sorts of um, different uh, questions that come up and um, also uh, the self-evaluation um, template and stuff that uh, ODOT worked very closely with Mike Fitch and LTOP to create a couple of years ago. Um, and then the last slide uh, in the presentation is um, ODOT's uh, references um, to uh, the Office of Roadway Engineering's uh, design resource page, um, our ODI ADA page, um, and uh, the overall design standards um, for facilities, um, as well as uh, uh, the uh, design standards. And also included in my part of the presentation is my contact information along with Christina's contact information. Um, we get lots of questions. Um, I get emails, um, phone calls uh, several times a week from local municipalities that have questions um, and just don't know quite how to go about tackling them. So we are always um, open and uh, uh, have a desire to help with these types of issues. So with that, um, I think Lisa was going to um, put out some poll questions and um, then at the same time, I'm going to go ahead and pass it over to Cody Doyle from the Lima Allen Regional Planning. Thank you, Sarah. Yes, I think we meant to do the poll questions first, but now we will put out a poll question. And our first poll question is up. You're voting very quickly. Okay. Manage pause. Okay, we're at seventy eight percent. In the rules. Okay. And I'm sorry, Mike, I don't see a button to stop the polling there. No problem. Let's share the results. Okay. So attending today, we have in the lead, the government agencies, local or federal, followed by state DOTs, our prime contractor and prime consultants, DBEs, and then subcontractors. We are going to do one more poll and then we will close our polls. Okay. We'll do the poll later. I'll go ahead and uh, 
I will introduce at this time, Shane Coleman and Cody Doyle. Shane Coleman was named Executive Director of the Lyman Allen County Regional Planning Commission in 2020. He has extensive experience at the Planning Commission, serving as President of the Board of Directors for three years and on various committees. Before joining the Lima Allen County Regional Planning Commission, he was the Safe Safety Service Director for the City of Delphus for six years. As, as its Chief Executive offer, Officer, he developed and directed the city's plans, policies, programs, and operations, and prepared and implemented the city's budget and financial strategies. In addition, he has coordinated the development of multiple infrastructure projects from water and sewer projects to transportation, bike, pedestrian, and safe routes to school projects. Cody Doyle has worked in planning for over five years. He was first introduced to ADA transition plans in 2017 when he began attending ODOT training seminars before working under former executive director Tom Mazur to complete plans for three villages in the county. He has also started consulting with member municipalities for upcoming ADA transition plans. Other areas of experience include safe routes to schools planning, road safety audits, downtown Lima parking study and comprehensive planning. Cody also chairs the safety review team meetings for Lima Allen County Regional Planning Commission. And welcome gentlemen. Thank you, Lisa, I appreciate the introduction. I uh, would like to take a minute just to thank you, Lisa and ODOT for the opportunity to participate in today's webinar. Uh, to say that we were a, a bit surprised when you asked us as a smaller MPO to participate uh, would be an understatement, but uh, we're happy you did so and, and very excited to participate here today. So um, I know we are asked to talk about transition plans uh, from the MPO perspective, uh, how we've helped some of our members create those plans and, and how we've utilized those. So uh, just to kind of give you a summary of what we'll talk about today, I would like to give you a brief introduction to kind of who we are and a bit of the history of ADA tra transition plans here uh, in Allen County. Uh, talk a little bit about how we've helped our members to create plans uh, and the process that we used uh, to facilitate that. Um, and then finally, we'll talk just a bit about how the plans that are in place right now are being used in our area. Uh, and then hopefully, either at the end of our, our segment or at the end of the, the webinar today, we'll have some time for questions from all of you. So um, I guess just to start with the background, just so you understand who we are as Lima Allen County Regional Planning, uh, we're kind of two separate things, or two things rolled into one. We are the MPO for the Lima Urbanized Area, uh, which encompasses all of Allen County. And we are also the Regional Planning Commission for Allen County. Uh, we're re responsible for quite a bit, but as it relates to today's webinar, uh, we're responsible for the cooperative, comprehensive, and continuous planning for our region. Uh, that, of course, involves infrastructure and transportation and safety access and ADA transition plans. I think I would be remiss if I did not start by uh, mentioning our previous director, my predecessor, Tom Mazur. Um, I think he's really... Um, the impetus behind uh, the priority that has been placed upon these ADA transition plans here in our region. Uh, Tom has always been an advocate for safety. Uh, he's always been a, an advocate for bike and pedestrian facilities. Uh, and I think that passion um, has gotten us to where we are, not just as an agency, but as a region today. So um, having been that advocate, having gotten behind uh, the fact that these ADA transition uh, plans that are required. Uh, he spent a great deal of time trying to educate our members. Uh, he did a lot of that through our internal committee meetings, uh, as well as getting out and speaking with all of our members and their legislative bodies. So I would say uh, from the board member perspective at the time, that wasn't always easy. Uh, we talked a lot about the legal requirements, right? That wasn't always popular. A lot of folks didn't understand why these were important, not just legally, but how we could use those 
for planning and construction activities in the future. So uh, it took a lot of time to get us to where we are. Uh, we're still not perfect. Uh, you know, as Sarah alluded to earlier, uh, there are still folks who don't have transition plans and, and some of our members are in that same boat as well. So uh, we do have multiple members, as mentioned, who have plans that have been created uh, by us, by themselves or by a consultant. They've been approved and they have been enacted. Um, most of our members are smaller members. We're a very rural area. Uh, so a lot of these entities um, can't necessarily uh, afford uh, the services of a consultant to help them. So we have stepped in and, and worked through some of this process. And that's what Cody's gonna speak to here in just a minute. Um, and then our larger members like the city of Lima, uh, they have created their own plan that's been approved, it's active now and they are, they are using that. So um, again, these, are, these have become very important to us. We continue to talk about them today. Uh, we, we mention them in uh, our committee meetings uh, multiple times throughout the year. We update our committees, we update our political subdivision partners. Um, I know I sometimes get the eye roll when I show up and we mention them again, uh, but they are aware that these are required and we are pushing them to that end. So uh, we currently are working with three of our, our local uh, members. Uh, so between now and um, July of next year, we hope to have plans in place for uh, the village of Spencerville, the village of Bluffton and the city of Delphi. So. Um, I think that's kind of where we are right now. Again, I uh, just want to thank ODOT for the opportunity today. I'm going to turn it over to Cody because he's really the, the resident expert here uh, at the MPO. He's uh, worked with Tom in the past and, and as stated, he's worked to help create three of these plans to date. So I'm going to have him walk through the process uh, that he uses um, to create the plan, talk a little bit about the surveys that they do. Um, as part of that process. And um, once he wraps up, we'll come back and we'll talk a little bit more about how we actually use the plans, how they're being utilized, and how uh, some of our members are, are cognizant of the issue of the ADA requirements, even though they don't have a plan in place yet. So Cody, I'll turn it over to you and, and thank you again. Okay, thank you. Um, as Shane mentioned, uh, Tom Mazer, our former executive director, started having these conversations um, years ago with members of our organization through um, a variety of committees. Um, I don't know for what the impetus was uh, to try to get this ball rolling here in um, like 16, 17 timeframe. Um, but this graphic that I have here is a timeline, the time being sort of less important than this being a good way to um, delineate the steps required to go from um, start to completion here. So this is an example from, I think this is the very first plan that we did. Uh, I wanna say this one was for um, Beaver Dam, a small village here in the Northern part of Allen County. Um, so usually the way we kind of like to get the ball rolling with this stuff is to just approach a village administrator. It's a little easier to get that initial buy-in from an individual uh, than it is to kind of um, go in and pitch the entire village council. Um, so we get that village administrator in place and um, start the conversation of the development of this plan. I think, like Shane said, um, it's important to reiterate that a lot of times you're dealing with, especially in the case of small villages, these um, budgetary constraints, right, when it comes to um, these plans, you know, with these improvements, it doesn't take long to rack up four or five hundred thousand dollars of improvements. And when you are talking to villages that are sort of already worried about um, a host of other expenses that they may have, this isn't something that they are always eager to jump in and be a part of. Um, I think it's important to stress that while these plans are sort of born from the um, the ADA trends, like the ADA aspect, uh, the disability community, these plans help everyone in the village. Um, it makes the entire village more walkable. It makes, um, it enhances curb appeal, uh, property value. Um, there are all kinds of good that comes from these. And again, it's not, which we'll kind of, I'll get to later, but um, nobody expects you to make all these improvements right away. These are long-term plans that are usually spread over a decade or more um, when we start looking at the actual expenses and the improvements. So th the first thing we do is get a small subcommittee in place and talk to those folks about the plans, why they're necessary, why they are expected to um, have these 
um, some of the dangers and not having the plans and um, try to get buy-in from there. So once we meet with the subcommittee, um, get sort of permission for lack of a better term to start on these plans, it kind of depends. Early with this example, I did most of um, the surveying, the sort of preliminary surveying work um, alone. With some of the bigger villages that we've done, we've tried to get buy-in from the, from the residents there and have them help with um, the survey. I think it's also important to note that while we do act in a sort of um, like consultant capacity, we do very much encourage these folks to make these plans their own. Um, the more that we can get input from public participation, the better these plans are. Um, they know the village better than me. Um, there's just a lot of benefit that comes from getting everyone involved. In this case, I did most of this work on my own first. It was a small village with maybe four miles, five miles of, um, of roadway to look at and maybe one public parking lot. So it really wasn't that bad. Um, I did most of the surveying, kind of got an idea of what I wanted to look at. And then we went back with uh, two gentlemen from the um, local, the local uh, low vision coalition. The more people that you can get involved from the disability community, the better. Um, they simply just have a better idea of what we are trying to spot as far as um, infractions that I do. Even though you can sort of look at the infractions, you can look that up that's out there. Um, they just from experience have a better idea of what kind of what kind of issues may cause someone a problem where um, you know something that like I might take for granted. So um, we walked, we again walked the streets with um, those folks. Um, sometimes it's faster to kind of do it when um, what we call a windshield survey, where we'll drive around, you can cover more ground a little bit faster. You just have to be careful as far as um, sidewalk heaving and those kind of things are prevalent. That's a little harder to spot from the vehicle. It really is better to at least walk everything at least once. Um, and again, we should note that the this component, what we do here, the public right of way surveys, is really only one component of an ADA transition plan. Um, your website, anything that is uh, the property of the municipality, really should be included in those transition plans. Um, so we don't do any of that stuff here at RPC. Um, we're just looking at the public right away. So once we go out, we get all that stuff done. Um, we have a list of, we have a list in place of infractions, non-compliance issues, um, whatever terminology you'd like to use. After there, um, the next thing is the prioritization. This is kind of the big component. As I said, a lot of times these improvements are going to be spread out over many years. We usually just look here at regional planning at the short term, midterm, and long term. Um, the, the kind of key phrase to me in the ADA legislation that I've read is access to civic life. So we definitely want to start with um, any sort of voting precincts or um, village administration property, anywhere that uh, post office, anywhere that we think is going to be um, pivotal for that for that civic life. Those are all going to be in the short term. Um, after that, we'll look at um, maybe public parks. Or I know um, Tom always wanted to look at um, churches as being in that sort of next tier. Um, we kind of prioritize everything here at regional planning. And then uh, that's when the public participation really becomes key as far as the village taking this plan and making it their own. Um, typically what we'll do is advertise a, um, a village council meeting in this case. 
where folks will be able to go and um, view the plan, voice their concerns, uh, tell us what they like, what they don't like. And this is really where they sort of uh, take ownership of everything that we have done. They often have a better idea of how to prioritize this than I do. Um, you know, nobody knows the village better than its own residents. And at the end of the day, we're sort of all working for them anyhow. Um, this is um, key. The more people that you can get at these meetings, the better, um, the more participation you can get, the better the plan is going to be. And I should also note here that we always stress in these meetings that these plans are, it's not like a, okay, I finished the plan, that's it, put a stamp on it. Um, they are living documents. They are meant to continue to be improved. Um, compliance is very much a, um, I don't want to say moving goalposts because that kind of has a negative conversation, but compliance is a sort of fluid objective that is, um, things can fall out of uh, compliance uh, new facilities are built um, you know you have to kind of check all that stuff so um, we always encourage people to keep that in mind at these meetings but once we have all the public input then we can go back and sort of tweak everything and um, get it finalized i'm certainly not an expert and uh local local government um, in my experience this has always been done by passing a resolution and then we will take that resolution and add it as part of the plan um, we usually make sure during the public participation phase that we try to post the plan on our website we try to give hard copies that are uh, available at the village administration building um, you know anything we can to try to get it viewed and that's kind of the uphill battle oftentimes is just to kind of get people to participate um, but the more times you can get it viewed the better and then once the resolution is passed like I said um, we can still continue to tweak the plans for the, um, from there I know that I went back and added things uh, for some of these villages in the past and updated those plans so we try to kind of keep a running tally of that um, the work that's been done, we can cross off um, an issue that pops up, we can add, et cetera. But that's pretty much the process that we have used so far. Um, it seems to work well for the smaller villages that we have done. Um, of course, if you take on something for a larger city, it's that this timeline is going to be a lot longer because there's going to be way more facilities that you're going to have to evaluate but other than that it's been um, pretty simple and it's also been um, something i think that is like i said benefits the entire village um, and once you kind of get people on board with um, all of the good that it's really a win-win proposition and i know that it comes with a price tag but a lot of this work is going to be um, it's going to have to be done regardless so it's just a matter of um, getting that all on paper and sort of um, getting everybody on board with um, these things that are required by law and, and do need to be remedied. I know that Shane has, a, um, when he was in Delphis, a lot of times they would he would sort of handle some of these issues as they would arise, um, complaints from residents, stuff like that. A lot of our um, municipalities are kind of in that mode right now that don't really have an official plan in place but do try to do improvements as residents call them to their attention thanks cody i appreciate that um I, a couple of things i, I did want to highlight before we, we go back to uh the comments cody ended with there uh I just kind of as part of this process and, and that we undertake to put these plans together i think there are a couple of things that are really important and that's the surveying of the facilities and as cody mentioned we've had some real small villages that we've been able to go in with our staff and take a look at those but as we look at our larger uh, members and, and as i mentioned earlier these three plans that we've worked into our work program this year uh, we're going to rely on on not just the administrators but hopefully some community members to participate in that function I, and as cody mentioned i think that's important um, I think the public participation piece is really important. And we talk about that a lot in what we do. Um, and we strive to uh, encourage as much of that as we can. But if we can get out of those communities, uh, get the folks involved, I think that really makes it a better document. Um, it gets more buy-in, not just from uh, administrators and legislators, but the community as well. 
And, and, and another real interesting piece, and I don't know how many are doing this, but if you're working on plans to any degree here, uh, what, what Tom started doing here by, by incorporating members of a low vision coalition into this process, it, it's really interesting. As Cody mentioned, uh, to have those folks involved, I know in Delphus, as we started our, our ADA transition plan a couple of years ago, um, we brought one of our, our local, um, local folks in who, who has some challenges visually, and it's just a, an entirely different perspective to, to have those folks out walking streets and sidewalks and, and encountering different obstacles. So um, I just think that's something neat that maybe you work to incorporate if possible. But uh, trying to, to get a, a, a well-rounded mix of people involved in the process is, is never a bad thing. So um, as we wrap up today, the, the last item that we were encouraged to discuss today, and that's really how we use these plans. Well, obviously, uh, we put together the Transportation Improvement Program, or, or the TIP, uh, and we're in the process of, you know, updating that for another couple of years here soon. But uh, we'll take these plans and the priorities that are incorporated in these plans, and, and we'll look at that as we're evaluating projects that are brought to us from our members. So as we look to, to uh, prioritize and program these federal dollars, um, this type of activity becomes important to what we do. I think it also becomes very important to our locals um, as they work to plan projects within their own subdivisions uh, that aren't necessarily eligible for federal dollars or um, eligible for any other funding from our organization. So um, as they look at those projects, they're beginning to understand the rules and the requirements um, and, and what's needed. We just had a one of our members, it was probably a month ago, they decided kind of, I would say, uh, a little bit last minute, I guess, uh, when you look at the construction season, but uh, decided they were going to pave a street in their community um, and called us with some questions about those alleys, right? Our sidewalks required across alleys and, and we're going to repave the street, but we're going to do all the curb ramps while we're at it. So while they may not have the plan in place yet, because of the work that we have done and work that other communities within our membership have done, uh, they become cognizant of those rules. Uh, they're calling us for guidance and recommendations, and they're taking those to heart and utilizing that. So, uh, but we'll use it in our planning here at the MPO. Uh, the locals will use it, and I think it's really become going to become even more important than it already is right now as you uh, begin to dig into ODOT's new long-range plan, that Access 2045 plan. You look at the Walk Bike Ohio plan. Uh, those are documents that uh, we're going to have to take into consideration as we continue to program projects for our future. Um, and so I think it's uh, it's going to be cognizant of everyone to take this into account, not just because of legal obligation, right? Because it's it's the right thing to do, and it's it's there there are issues that need to be addressed. Um, and and so that's kind of what we'll use it for. I think on the on the flip side of this, coming from my my previous job um, as a city administrator, I think if you put a plan together and you prioritized. Uh, these different areas or issues throughout your community. It helps provide some justification, right? Because um, if you've been involved on that side of, of the, the table long, you understand that someone's always questioning, you know, well, why is my neighbor getting this? Why am I not getting that? Uh, so I hope, I, I think this helps to justify budgets, justify timelines, uh, projects, and things of that nature. So um, I know that's a real quick summary of, of how we use those, but certainly happy to answer any questions at the appropriate time. And again, really thank everyone for your attention today. Thank you. Okay, I am going to make um, Cody late the presenter here and okay. allow him to commence. Okay, as you are doing that, there is one more poll question that probably really fits into uh, what was just asked. So we'll take the poll question. Also, remember, if you have questions, please put them in the questions panel. We are getting some questions. We will get to those at the end of all the sessions. We're at about 42% that have voted so far. <laughs>
Okay, we'll close our poll. Oops. And so we have 51% who are unsure if they've completed their, their plan. So hopefully after today, uh, you'll have some tools in your toolbox to help you work on your uh, self-evaluation or your transition plans. Okay. Our next presenters are Scott Mullins and Cody Lake. Scott Mullins is a civil engineer who earned a Bachelor of Science of Civil Engineering from Ohio Northern University. He has worked at ODOT for 30 years, all in construction, and is currently the district construction engineer for ODOT District 1, overseeing the district's construction program. Cody Late is ODOT District 1's transportation asset management coordinator where he is responsible for collecting, tracking, and reporting on all assets in District 1. He has worked at ODOT for 11 years in both offices of planning and information technology. Welcome, guys. <laughs> Scott, you're on mute. Got you still muted there, are you? Great, we hear, oh, well, we hear Cody. It looks like you're unmuted, Scott. No, we cannot hear you. Okay, someone is typing. I'm not sure, Cody, if you want to get started and we'll, we'll see if we can bring Scott in. <laughs> okay. Yeah, we can definitely do that. Um, I might not hit everything dead on to how Scott was going to present this, so we'll see if he can get his audio back in here. Um, but just like uh, uh, Sarah was talking about, uh, we were just going to go more into the depths here uh, real briefly again. Uh, we've had some interesting conversations in our district alone. Um, I've talked to a few other districts as well. But for the uh, sake of today, uh, try to go over some construction work types and construction. Um, be into the depths of ADA, what, what type of items are you maybe looking at? Uh, opportunities for construction, just like we said, the transition plans being created. Uh, you know what is currently not compliant. So what other opportunities uh, are coming out here? And then um, I was going to go more in depth of the ADA compliance as well as how we are collecting our ADA elements, so our asset collection side of things. So um, with some of the construction work types here, um, Scott was going to describe here a little bit, was uh, we have a type, uh, work type 38, uh, miscellaneous concrete work, uh, which would entail a lot of, you know, if we talk about sidewalks and curb ramps, entail that area there. So there is plenty of opportunity in our projects um, that contain this type of work. Uh, so if you are looking for doing, getting into helping out with these, you know, uh, ADA elements, uh, that'd be one work type that uh, we've really associated out a lot of times. Um, the other one is a work type 44. 
Um, that's going more into the pedestrian signal heads, the accessible buttons, the video detection, just kind of more the electrical side of things. Um, because again, those are still associated with ADA as well. Um, and again, with each of those um, do come uh, numerous materials as well that um, go into each one of those um, that could uh, help build or construct that, that item in those work types. Um, the uh, next item here, um, again, kind of what Sarah was showing earlier, um, our current collection for ADA, um, I'll get into depths of that system here in a minute, are kind of listed here, um, you know, our accessible orange street parking, our crosswalks, curb ramps, our push buttons, push button structures themselves, refuge islands, and sidewalks. So anything, this is just showing just the active state maintained system. So again, like we've said, uh, being in a local, you have probably much more than what we do, and we're only currently showing our active system. So hey, with that, yeah. I'm sorry. Let's see. Can Scott, can you come in yet? No. Okay. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> You're good. Some of our computers these days, uh, is it once in a while, updates seem to take out a few different parts, unfortunately. <laughs> um, yeah, Scott keep, keeps trying to come in here. Um, I'll keep on going as well here. There's a couple parts I'll just stop and uh, skip those, come back to them at the end if he's able to hopefully get in with us. Um, but yeah, for this one here, um, the sake of our the other uh, activities to look for, here's the opportunities. Unfortunately, um, even for our state maintained uh, elements, um, the value in here in the middle are the non-compliance. So with being a 60, you know, 60% 60 non-compliant with curb ramps, even on the state system, our plan alone is to definitely maintain them and fix them. Um, unfortunately with funding, we're just not gonna go replace all curb ramps today. But uh, as we do resurfacings, uh, that's our biggest indicator that helps us to drive that bus, that we'll add these ones into that project and get them remedied and repaired. Um, and as the other elements as well. So this one here, um, yeah, just again, we're just trying to reiterate um, again with the Title II requirements. Um, the uh, resurfacing de definitely does trigger us for any type of curb ramp insulation or retrofit. So anytime, uh, again, if we're going to affect that crosswalk area for um, a sidewalk connection with two curb ramps, just sidewalk connection, uh, we'll make sure that the accessible um, the pedestrians are able to go from one side to the other. So that's our major um, item there we're, we're, we're looking into. Then the other part of that is again, you know, this is all we know is law. So we got to really take this in regards to the, the cost and funding source it isn't really, you know, we got to do it where it's practical, but it's with without regards to those, you know, we got to do this for the uh, sake of uh, people just in commuting the, across the uh, our, our, our systems and so forth. So going further, um, Contractor responsibility. Uh, I may see again if Scott has uh, some more information to mention into here. But uh, again, when we as for ODOT, if we do have these in our project to uh, build, uh, we provide many different uh, standards and so forth to make sure we're building the compliant. So again, it's up to the contractor to make sure they are built compliant. We're going to give you the best, or we're going to give you all the guidelines to build it. It's just up to you to make sure that you get the concrete finished perfect and so forth for these to be acceptable. Um, there is a few times um, that in case where it's not practical, you know, we have a building right next to it or right, right behind where the trunk or this curb ramp is going to be placed. It's not practical for us to tear down a whole building just to put a whole curb ramp in. Um, so with that being said, we still got to do the best we can to build it as usable as, we, as possible. But what we're going to do into our system is what we call an ADA waiver. Um, what that's going to indicate to us is next time we do have more, uh, more funds 
that we can do a better job or even relocation of these curb ramps or something to that intersection, we'll use this as a waiver to come back to it during the next project. Again, we don't wanna just do work to do work um, and we're gonna make sure we do the best job possible as well. So we do have a waiver process. The other part of the waiver process though is it's up to our district design engineer to review the waiver, to approve the waiver or deny it. So he's going to say through um, type of survey, you know, can this be feasible or can it not be feasible? Um, now where this does get a little bit uh, tricky as well, um, any of our local LEP projects um, or even any projects that we do uh, resurf resurfacing and we do have curb ramps in that corridor, um, we'll also do this for local, those, anything with federal funding, we'll have to do a waiver process if it cannot be built built compliant. So if you do have one that uh, you do have federal funds to, and you know, you, you know, through design, you can't build it, we'll go ahead and put a waiver into our systems, re reiterating to our FHW, FHWA reporting that, uh, hey, we had about 12 waivers this year for local projects or 10 to our ODOT projects, and just indicate that, hey, um, we we're not able to do so and get back to that. And then um, last but not least is, uh, you know, with these curb ramps, um, for the sake of compliance, um, if it, it does come down to it that it wasn't, or the, the values are out of compliant and they was placed into it or, you know, it was laid in the concrete work. Um, unfortunately, it is a remove and replace at the contractor's cost. Uh, we're going to do the best we can to make sure that that doesn't happen through our designs, try to catch things earlier. But there is going to be a sake of it that when you lay the concrete, if or the finisher didn't slope it right or they pull too much concrete in um, just because they just was flaring it into it too much, um, cause it to be not compliant, they're going to have to come back and replace that at their own cost. And so far, me doing this for three years, um, our 88 compliance, the contractors definitely do not like me coming back and tell them to <laughs> re remove and replace this item. So it is, it is extremely costly. So with that being said, going into our uh, construction plans and so forth, um, here is some of our details that we have provided before in some of our plan sets for ODOT again. Um, you know, some of these like on the left-hand side, we're gonna give you all the elevations. Um, we have a chance to get survey onto it and here's our elevations and here's the, the slopes and here's the widths and so forth. Um, so some of them on the left, you're, you're going to get a lot of detail, but quite a few of them, unfortunately, we provide, we don't have the cost to be able to go survey 100% of all of our projects. So like on the sake of the right, we at least know we went out with a smart level. We can take this many panels out, take it this far, take it this far. So as, as a contractor, um, Sometimes you might want stuff on the left to make sure you are building it to the right elevations. Uh, the other time is like on the right, well, you might like that because you at least know how many panels to take it to as well. So there is a little difference of plan sets and so just be aware of that um, as you do kind of look for at, look at ODOT for a project. Um, and again, if, if you're looking at as local, uh, these are kind of just two different examples. If you do have to write up a, a plan set for uh, construction. These are kind of a few things that we kind of write out as well. Scott, have you made a chance back on yet? Oop, okay. <laughs> um, so that was kind of going uh, very quickly into Scott's section um, and, and talking. We wanted to really go over to where he felt um, some items were at and then at the same time for uh, the, uh, the sake of our uh, presentation, we wanted to also show our collection methods as well. So with that being, oh, okay. No, I was gonna, Scott, have you looked in the chat? Mike gave you some solutions that might help to get your mic going. I'm sorry, go ahead. You're good, Elisa. <laughs> um, so going further, I'm going to go now into the depths of what I myself, um, again, kind of get, get, getting out of the transition plan side when doing a compliance check for a curb ramp. 
Um, I do a lot more of the construction evaluations. Um, so once they do finalize, I have another inspector as well. Um, that ha he does actually he does majority of the of them now. Uh, take helping me take over those roles now. Um, but our three major items that we look at is the public right of way accessibility guidelines, which is ProWeg. Um, if you've heard them, utilize them, and so forth. Um, it's not a law. Um, it is not an enforceable standard at this point in time, but FHWA has recognized it as a recommended best practice, which in turn, with that being said, ODAP has adopted it. So we've, we, we're, we went full go with that, and that's how we're emphasizing our compliance to is with ProWag. The other values I'm looking a lot at is our standard construction drawing. And then we've recently updated those as well as our curb ramp measuring guide. So if any of our uh, construction engineers have a question or designers have a question, I refer to those three items first. And then if I don't have an answer, I'll go on to further, uh, further resources like uh, Sarah has provided. With that being said, um, here are the major items, I would say as ODOT as a whole, we look at for our compliance standards. Um, as our updated uh, standard drawings, construction runnings or the ramp running slope as well as the ramp landing and cross slope have been tightened up since what we have in the past. We're at now a 13 to one and 64 to one. Um, those in the past, we was at a, a 12 to one for the ramp slope as well as a 50 to one for the cross slopes. So the other value we've also updated due to manufacturer standards, as well as some different guidance in ProWeg, is where the truncated domes, they are required to go full width of the pedestrian access route um, for the ramp. Um, however, with these manufacturers, sometimes they, they need a two inch border and that helps encapsulate it and make sure it doesn't shift one way or the other, um, if any shifting does happen. So we've updated our standards to contain that as well. The other major values that I look at the most when I do a compliance check is our flush with surface, as well as our gutter and ramp slopes. Um, I don't want a pinch point going to our gutter and ramp slope for a person in a wheelchair uh, or a motorized scooter of some sort. Um, we don't ever want the wheelchair to really hit a sharp point going down or um, in the opposite direction if they were to go up it. You know, we don't want them getting stuck or getting hurt flipping their wheelchair and so forth. And I have another photo to kind of show that up further. But the other item flush with surface. Um, when we look at it now in, in our district and organization, flush with surface goes from anywhere from the sidewalk to the street. So where the asphalt meets the any section of the concrete, any grade break or section through there, uh, all of those need to be flush. Now, there is an acceptance of up to a quarter of an inch um, in our guidelines, unfortunately, that we can accept it if it is a quarter inch there. Uh, again, we want as smooth as possible, but anything over a quarter of an inch, if it's a quarter to half, they have to bevel it. And majority of the time, if we have anything uh, more than a half, uh, we have the contract come th back through and grind, do uh, uh, either grind on the concrete or on the asphalt to make it the transition better. So those are major values for our compliance. Now, as I did state, uh, we are following ProWeg and we did tighten up our standard construction drawing. Um, we do, 100% of our compliance and back to ProWeg. So on the right is our ODOT standard drawing, or is our ODOT standards. Um, however, for our finalized compliance, if the cross slope here is at 1.8%, um, is not compliant to our ODOT standards, but we will accept it due to our ProWeg compliance, which is at 2%. So I really wanted to add this part in this slide because I've had a lot of uh, discussions with our contractors this year since we just updated uh, the standards last year um, and trying to really hit this home to them. Um, again, the, the better you can, st the better they can build under it, that's what we want. Um, but if there is a uh, really tight threshold um, due to the road profile here not meeting too well, then these are the, the values we can go up to. Um, with that being said, I know I've been uh, talking a lot about our curb ramps. Um, so here's an example of the other values we look at. I won't go much more in depth with those there. Um, 
but uh, those are the other values we do collect and we're adding a few extras with our next enhancement to our application we're using currently. The other values, for example, here's some of our push button structures um, and our push button, um, what characteristics we're looking for to be compliance. Some of these are getting changed as well. Uh, we'll be updated here very shortly. Um, so as I said, being updated to what are we utilizing and so forth, um, that goes to the system Sarah was referring to earlier called our collector, uh, collector system. Um, what that does is allow us to use a computer or a mobile device, an iPad or cell phone, um, so we can do this out in the field. And uh, at that point in time, uh, um, I mean, you see some of these other parts, you can, we can take photos, we can um, take those uh, values, so they cross slopes, land, landing slopes, and different things like that, add it right into it as a attribute for that dot. Um, I'll get more, into, more photos here in the description here in just a minute, but that helps streamline our collection methods of these. Um, as it streamlined it, it also helped us to do a non-compliance. If we had a chance and we had an intern that we needed to give them some work to do or we had a section that got done, yes, we could just give them a side pad. Here's where you take measurements at and uh, put into this iPad. We don't have to tell them what the compliance values are. The system automatically knows it. So it will help them to just go ahead and collect the data, get it into the system, and we move on. The other major part that we liked about this system was it has a date stamp. So every time we hit save, whether it be in the field or in the office, we have a record of that value. So if by chance the curb ramp we, we accepted on a construction project, let's say five years ago, but as of today, we have a resurfacing project coming through and it's not compliant this year. Well, you know, we don't know exact why it went not compliant, but we can at least see the values we put into the system five years ago. If it was right at the threshold 2%, and now it's that 2.2% of a cross slope and a truck strain over the curve, hey, that's why it's at 2.2%. We got just we got to replace it. We got to remove it, fix it, and replace it to make it back compliant and usable. So the date stamp there really helped us uh, with some of our other elements we've had over the past. Um, not photos. Uh, the very last part I just wanted to mention about this application for collector is it does have, or, or as we're making this in enhancements to this on different values to collect as well, um, we're gonna get this done early next year. Again, this is all of our central office location updating this, but we are going to, with our, our last approval is going to allow this for locals to get access to. So the development of it and how that's going to be interpreted and how it's going to be used has we're still sorting that stuff up. But as of early next year, we're hoping that uh, we'll have all those guidelines created. And uh, if you as a local or a MPO would like to have access to this application, um, it should be readily available to you. So that's something to come. Um, I know Sarah said she's been mentioning that for a while. Uh, fingers crossed, the last few meetings I've, I've been in part of is sounding much more prominent to be coming. So how does this collector system work? As I said, here's more of a computer uh, screenshots of it. And as Sarah said too, you know, here's our dots and so forth, what they represent. Um, as I zoom into an intersection to our, my uh, designers, this has really tremendously helped them as to they can kind of come into a corridor um, and kind of see, okay, well, we, yep, we have all these ADA elements or my, the other assets in our organization that we collect. Which of them are not compliant? So, well, I'll get to not compliance here in just a minute, but you can go ahead and more visually look at a corridor and see where items are and see, okay, well, what's going on? Now, if you had a concern about an item, all you do is click on it. Here's the information about that item. So this blue dot was a curb ramp. It was a perpendicular type of curb ramp, and here's the values for it. Meaning it's all compliant, and that's looking great. Now the quick item for non-compliance, we have another layer you just turn on. Now this is what the designers like. Okay, now I can see I got non-compliance of this intersection. What items are they? And they can go ahead and see what they are. This project is in the scope to handle these. Let's get these added to the project. So these are the major items that uh, utilizing with our compliance as well as my collection of asset management. These are a few of the tools that we have. Um, the next part where I just want to kind of just slowly touch base into, um, we just felt that uh, 
we've we've had as an organization i know you guys just was talking about the transition plans other items that could be common issues and this doesn't just go for what we identify for uh, replacements this is also going for um, from construction if something was built incorrectly by accident or was an old uh, standard that we thought was acceptable that just isn't acceptable anymore so here's the major common issues that I've iterated to our construction staff to keep very take a look at and keep caution to. But we don't want any turning on the ramp. Uh, any turning for a uh, curb ramp type is, should be in the landing areas. Um, we've had a few of them still. That's unfortunately where we had them. Um, we've had them be re completely removed and replaced on the contractor's cost. Um, our other items are grade breaks, like I talked before. Um, truncated domes not being placed full width. We've had a few of them where the curb ramp width was uh, too small. Um, so that's something, again, you got to really catch catch on to those and really watch that as well. And then we have a road profile of matching. So here I got a few other photos to kind of try to reiterate these items for consideration. So with that being said, um, you know, turning space on the landing, it just really uh, try it really makes it difficult for a person um, in uh, mobile capacity, you know, whether they feel confident in the turning of it is a chance where they could tip over. We just need to make sure wherever they turn is a flat area. It makes them feel secure as well as allows them to take a break before they have to transition onto the next part of where they're where they're going to. Then as well, the change of grade. Uh, going back to that, this is why. Um, a few, a few of the three years that I've been doing this, these these collections now, I've had a few times as, uh, you know, um, uh, Shane, you mentioned talking to other people with visual impairments, or um, I've had a few chances to uh, talk to uh, the public as they're out utilizing their uh, scooter or in a wheelchair. And, uh, you know, they'll call out a few curb ramps. Hey, can you go check these? Well, I really, you know, those are on the local side. We're not touching them or, yeah, those are getting touched with our project. And uh, I make sure to really keep my eye on to that area. Um, but these are the items that really takes them for consideration. You know, don't want them to flip over backwards or flip forward. It can cause more harm to them. Uh, to go further into here, uh, to kind of wrap this up here, um, Again, these two curb ramps look pretty darn good. Uh, fresh concrete, the truncated domes look nice and so forth. But to both of these, I had to have the contractor come back through, rip them out and redo them, um, to, unfortunately. The reason for that, the one picture on the left-hand side, again, this truncated dome needs to be placed into the pedestrian access route, the full width of it. So because we have furniture, you know, uh, for, you can talk about the different furniture and the access route or so forth. You know, this access route comes all the way over off the screen a little bit. You know, this side might be acceptable, but it'd be better off to even shift this even further. So this truncated dome should go that full extent. Now, this is all flat here. So that's why it should go the full width. If this was a raised curb and we had flares here, that would have been acceptable. Unfortunately, so no curb is all flat. The truncated dome placement should have been all the way through. The same thing goes to the one on the right hand side. It did not exceed the two inch uh, allowment on both sides and it wasn't full width. So we had to flag it for being replaced. Now, I think this one, instead of just replacing the truck and dome, we had some uh, ramp issue as well. So this was a complete remove replace. A lot of times they'll just come in and just cut out this uh, section of the truncated dome and just replace that and add another panel in here as well, two panels side by side. And as long as they do that, we just tell them it has to be flush. Even across the joint this way, it has to be flush for the, if they do two panels side by side. Uh, the other reason for that, I've been told, you know, with the visual impairment, um, you know, if you were, if one of the, if someone was to be walking, um, exceeding two inches, a foot can step on either side of the truncated dome, and in one single stride, you could step over this. Typically, it does not happen, but it is a case that could happen, and we don't want someone getting injured or something of that nature. So go ahead, put this truncated dome to the full width or two inches, and uh, I think you'd be much safer in the outcome of that. Uh, here's another one we had. The curb ramp looks pretty darn good. Um, unfortunately, I did have to flag this for the contractor. And the reasoning for it, um, you can, we could look at it in two ways, either curb ramp width being the usable width for a uh, wheelchair to be able to use this, 
um, or add flagged it with a flush with surface because as we have this little lip here on the left hand side, um, which their their solution to this was they came back in here and grinded this section of the concrete out, which then in that in that case it did not exceed any ramp limits. This was already flat as it was, uh, made it compliant, making no lip here. They beveled this all the way out and it was back to a curb ramp being a full width. So there's two different ways you can look at these curb ramps being not compliant. So we just flagged it, that was the solution, we got that fixed. And the last not least to kind of wrap this up, um, here was one curb ramp. Unfortunately, we had a contractor come back to four times. Um, and at that point in time, just so that things were as what it was. You know, again, it looks like a nice curb ramp here because we exceed a two inch threshold on the border, that's not compliant. We had to get this removed. We also had some asphalt up here causing a lip. We needed to grind it. Um, they did come through um, and cut this out. They did that later in the winter. Um, so we had to come back through uh, at, more into the next year into January. Um, weather was opened up, but in, in that time frame, as this went to subdivision, vehicles ran the curb. And since we did not accept this project yet, this curb ramp had to be removed and replaced because this is now dropped down at least two inches here. So even though it's not what the contractor's intent was for this to go non-compliant during the winter, um, since the project was still open, we had to have them come and remove, repair this, remove and replace it. So as they did to fix that remedy, um, again, this section looked fine. They went ahead and do some more concrete work to make sure that never happened again. They moved the chunky dome over and now they exceeded two inches on this side. So the very last part, since I could not accept this, was at five inches here. Um, since we could not accept it being an extension of two inches, we just told them come through here and cut this back out. It still had four foot and that had been compliant. So there's the final outcome of that. It doesn't look too pretty with this out here, but again, it was to remedy the other issue we had of it dropping out. And we added more quantity of concrete in here as well. So as you do look into construction or into this concrete work or curb ramp type of work, um, it is black and white, uh, what's acceptable, what's not acceptable. Uh, we're trying to do our best to reach out and if you have questions about those items, I, I've tried my best to uh, meet with the contractors for any ODOT, ODOT project because um, uh, any ODOT let project in our district region, uh, um, myself or uh, my counterpart will be making sure we get those measurements done um, and then as this year he's been taking care of those for me as well. So uh, we try our best to meet with them, try to make sure all the questions are answered. So with that being said, uh, here's some of my uh, references and documents that we have. And here's our contact list, our uh, contact information. Scott, was you able to make it back on? No, unfortunately he wasn't. <laughs> okay, well, I know we're getting close to the end of our meeting for today. So Lisa, um, I think I will uh, turn this back over to you. And uh, sorry for Scott missing uh, the technical side here. You have a glitch there. But uh, yeah, thank you everyone for allowing us to do this presentation. And uh, I'll go from there. So Lisa, I'll give this back to you here. Okay. All right. Thank you. So we do have a few questions. Um, we are getting pretty close. Um, well, we are very close to time. Um, sorry. Bear with me from the beginning. Oh Lord, from the beginning. Sorry, I want to stay. Okay, I am going to start with uh, the questions, and um, anyone who has a great answer can uh, chime in. Our first question. Are detectable warning panels required at signalized commercial driveways? Yes. Okay. And there's another question a couple down from that, Lisa, that says, uh, are truncated domes needed at driveways? So they are not required. Uh, curb ramps and truncated domes are not required at driveways but they are required at signalized commercial driveway. So there's a difference. If it's a signalized commercial driveway, they are required. If it's just a regular residential, low traffic driveway, even commercial, but low traffic uh, driveway, then they are not required. 
Okay. Let me make this announcement because we are pretty close to time. Uh, we're going to go over maybe 10 minutes or less. If you can continue to stay with us, please do. If not, I will let you know that everyone who has attended the session will, will, will receive a general certificate of training. Please allow about a week before that is processed, but everyone will get a general certificate of training. Also, um, ODI will be hosting our annual consultant services matchmaker. This year, we will be including construction firms also. That will be September 21st and 22nd. Be on the lookout for more information regarding this upcoming event, but that will be coming up. So thank you if you do have to leave and we'll continue with the questions. As a consultant, how can I gain experience in transition planning? And perhaps Cody Doyle, maybe you can take that. <laughs> I'm sorry, one more time. As a consultant, how can I gain experience in transition planning? Um, I don't, that, I do not know. I've never, I'm not, obviously I'm not a private consultant. If that's what he's asking about, it's a totally different relationship where like our membership memberships are um, incentivized to work with us because um, they already pay a membership and it's largely free. So if you're trying to go out and solicit clients, um, that is outside of my arena. If that was the nature of the question. Okay. Um, I and Sarah, you might be able to help me on this. Is there any training that LTAP would provide on transition planning? Um, yeah, Lisa, we, we've conducted some training, um, but there's also uh, lots of other external training opportunities. Um, I, uh, I'm, I'm a little bit, I, that's a, it's a great question, but I'm also a little bit at a loss, kind of like Cody was, just because that's not um, uh, what we do as a, as a public um uh, servant uh, kind of a thing. Um, but if the uh, person that asked the question would like to send me an email, I can try to um, find some some resources. Um, maybe if I ponder the question for a couple of days, something might come to me for a better answer. I apologize. Um, it's a good question. Um, I just don't have a great answer. <laughs> okay. And I can say that we do have access to who did uh, send in the question. So if we do not get to your question, we will reach out uh, within ODOT to find an answer and we will get back with you. Yeah, I would add um, just as like as far if you're just looking for um, training like materials um, to sort of become um, abreast with all of the things that we deal with. I mean, I personally started with going to um, several of Sarah's trainings and a lot of that information is on the web. Now, if you're looking for experience actually developing the plan, um, I don't have any insight for that. Okay. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Our next question, can curb ramps be non-performed on a resurfacing project if the ramps are on a municipal plan for reconstruction in the future? So that's probably a Sarah question. Um, and the answer to that is potentially. Um, it just kind of depends uh, on how far out that work is scheduled. Um, I can say, and I would assume that Cody Lape will agree with me and possibly even Cody Doyle, um, it, it doesn't always make a lot of sense to do two separate projects. Um, it typically makes sense to do the ramps prior to a right, you know, directly prior to a resurfacing project or right along with it. Um, but uh, technically, D depending if we had a little more detail, potentially 
that could be a yes, but the, the answer is it depends. Thank you. And I just put some information, <coughs> excuse me, out for everyone. <clears throat> Excuse me, there was an answer <clears throat> regarding um, some place where you can access information on transition planning. So I did put that in the chat for everyone to see. <clears throat> Another question, and this will probably be our last question, unfortunately. Again, for questions we do not get to, we will get back to you and email you the information. <clears throat> um, well, we'll email it to everyone. <clears throat> Can you explain if ADA compliant curve ramps are required when only performing a signal project? Um, I'll take that question as well. Uh, Cody, please feel free to jump in if you would like. Uh, that is another that uh, depends answer. <laughs> um, I would need a little bit more information to give a good answer um, because uh, my interpretation of a um, signal project might be different than your actual scope of the project. Um, so it just, again, I hate providing this as an answer of it depends, but if you wanna follow up with a little more detail to your specific question, then we can get you a, a better answer. Yeah, Sarah, I have to second that as well from the guidance I've been given so far. It would depend, and it needs some more details, unfortunately. Yeah, and from reading through some of the questions that everyone submitted, um, some of them are going to require a little bit of additional uh, follow up. Um, I'll double check with um, some of our engineers and make sure that um, we're giving you the best possible answer to the scenario that you posed. So um, once we get all the questions submitted, um, just give us a little bit and we'll make sure that um, we get uh, the best answer. Um, and hopefully, uh, for some of the questions, we can, you know, provide uh, the section of the regulation um, for some more specifics, if you if you would like. Okay, thank you very much, Sarah, for that. And with that, we're going to end our session. Again, you will receive a copy of the um, recording and also the handouts. We will also get back on answering questions that were not answered. Um, again, once you get the handouts, please feel free to reach out to um, any of the contacts that are listed in the particular handouts um, if you need to have more clarification. Again, we thank you so much for spending your afternoon with us. Um, we hope that this was informative um, and thank you. And we look forward to, host, to having you participate on other webinars. Have a great afternoon.